church, everybody. I hope everybody's good today. How many of y'all ever been to the dentist? Anybody? How many of y'all ever had a bad tooth? Oh, how many of y'all have a bad tooth? <laughs> no, it's a, like right now, you drink a cold drink of water, you try to chew something. Oh, have y'all ever had that? Mm. And it always hits at the worst time, right? When you're, it always just, it, it's not convenient. It's not when you would want it to happen. It'll happen. And uh, the Bible in Proverbs 25, it actually, let me read it to you. <clears throat> it says, putting confidence in an unreliable person in times of trouble is like chewing with a broken tooth. Or walking on a lame foot. Did y'all know that was in there? When we're unreliable, when we, when we don't grow into a mature believer and we become unreliable, the Bible equates it to like chewing on a bad tooth. It's like you can't count on it. You can't put weight on it. You know, when you chew, there's a lot of pressure that your jaw produces to chew your food. So we can't put pressure. We can't hold things. And today, I, I want to talk about growing in our reliability. Not, not just as a church. I, well, I say not, not just as a, as a corporate church, but individually, are we growing into reliable disciples of Christ? Are we growing into something that can hold weight, that can, uh, according to Colossians, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 2, that can produce something of overflowing that would be attractive to the world? Because God's plan to win back his man by preaching the good news is that the one that carries the good news lives a lifestyle that is attractive. That the world would look at the life st at someone and say, wow, I want what they have. Sometimes we can, if we're not careful, we, we don't look any different than the world as the church. And so part of our growth is to let the world fade away from us and for us to look more like the image of Christ. Am I, are you all following me? We, he, he wants us to become the image of Christ of Christ. When he created uh, man in the garden, he says, I made man in my image and my likeness to have dominion. Genesis 126, he says, I made him in my image and in my likeness to have dominion. The very first thing that he expects from every man and every woman in here is that we would be the reflection of God to the world. First in your family, first in your relationship with you and your wife, in your relationship with your children, and then in the relationships that go beyond that. And he's saying, I made you to, to do that, to reflect me. So the only way that we can reflect him is to know what to reflect. Really, the only way to reflect, if it's a reflection, I'm changed. Right? I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to just portray something that I'm not. I just portray who I am. And in Christ, he changes everything. Are you with me? Colossians 2, get your Bible out. Go to, this is today, is what we call Family First Sunday. Is this today? Is today Family First? Good. I'm just making sure. I saw all in shirts. I was like, I've been running all over the place. So I'm back. Uh, if you're a, a young, uh, between six, or if you're a young person in here, you should have got one of these. It's a bulletin for today. If you didn't get one of these, I want you to raise your hand and I want my ushers running. Running down, raise your hand if you didn't get one, if you need one. Give it, to, give it to your kids, let them hold it. And I want you, young people, I want you to follow along with what I'm going to talk today. I'm going to break it down so that we can all understand. Family First Sunday is about bringing the children into the main church. Right? Eventually, the children are going to grow up and they've got to learn main church. So why not start now and just take one weekend, bring them down, let them see mom and dad worship, sit with mom and dad. And, and, we, and, and for a preacher, it helps us break it down better. Break it down so that everybody can understand it, all right? So the first picture on the back, it says draw a picture. I want you to draw a tooth. Kids, that's your assignment right now, draw a tooth. Colossians 2. 
Colossians 2, 6 through 7 says this. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, and abounding with thanksgiving. Another translation says, and overflowing with thanksgiving. This is Colossians 2, 6 through 7. Mark it down, write it down. On the main scripture passage, kids, on, on this is right where it says main scripture. Write Colossians 2, 6 through 7. So the first thing that I noticed in this scripture is he says, as you have received Christ, so walk in him. Now listen, this is important to catch because a lot of people live their lives trying to serve God by just receiving him. And there's a moment in our lives where we've all, if you're a believer, where you walked an altar, you answered a, a call, you, whatever, however you got saved, you got saved, you received him. But Colossians 2 says there's more. He says you don't just need to receive him, you have to also so walk in him. Walk in him. That means that for the rest of your life, you see, a lot of people think, well, all I got to do is walk an altar, say yes to Jesus. He changes my life. I've got heaven now, and I can just walk however I want. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, no, as you received him by faith, right, you received him by faith, as you received him by faith, so I need you to walk in him by faith. He said, I want you to walk this life out in him. In the Old Testament, the Bible says that God walked with Adam in the cool of the garden. In the New Testament, there's a huge difference. In the Old Testament, God walked with us. In the New Testament, God walks in us. We, we, there's something shifted. He says, I'm no longer just going to be upon you and by you. I'm not going to be a pillar of fire and a cloud of smoke away from you. I'm going to live on the inside of you. That's the mystery of the New Testament, that when he died, he gave the Holy Spirit for the Holy Spirit to live on the inside of me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Listen, and we have to learn how to live on the inside of him. So when we walk in him, we can't get in front of him. Right? When we start walking, the, we, if we're walking with the Lord, we're, we're, we're careful that we're following where he's going, not where I want to go. So to walk in him means that I have to walk circumspectly. I have to consider all the things. I've got to know his character. I've got to know who he is. I've got to know kind of his mind. And he says he'll give me the mind of Christ. I've got to know how he walks. I've got to know that when I run into a situation that, oh, Jesus would not go this way. He'd go this way. And we know that by walking in him. Walking in him. He said, I want you to walk in me. Walking. Did he say, just as you've received him, I want you to run with him, run in him? He didn't say run in him. He didn't say gallop in him. He didn't say skip in him. You all like that? He didn't say skip, he didn't say gallop, he didn't say fly, he said walk. He's more interested in your consistency than he is in your ability. He ain't, he ain't interested that you can run faster. Come on, y'all ever use them fast, remember the fastbacks back in the day? The fastback tennis shoes, they were the track shoes, they made you faster. When I was in junior high, we wanted, everybody wanted the pair of the black ones with the lines. There were track shoes. Man, when you put those things on, it was the shoes. No. In a world of competitiveness, in a world of, of, of being raised up in performance and competitive, we think that God wants to see how fast we can run and we're trying to show off for God. And God's like, son, you don't need to show off for me. I loved you. I made you. I loved you before you ever did anything for me. <laughs> I've loved you when you were lost in your stuff. When you were in the, in the trap house, I loved you. When you were on the streets, I loved you. When you couldn't do anything for yourself or for me, I loved you. I just need you to walk in me. Stop trying to perform for me. 
walk in me. He said, walk in me. When we walk, it, 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 walking includes how I conduct myself and how I regulate myself. It, 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 it talks about how I live and, and how I think. Because how I think regulate, um, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So that's why he says you need to renew your mind. Y'all with me with the scripture? That's why the, the Bible says, and God says, hey, you need to renew your mind. Because every time you remo- renew your mind, you walk different. Too many of us are trying to change how we're walking without a renewal of the mind. And it never lasts. It's all willpower. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to drink. And then you drink. Are you with me? I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. You're trying to will it, force it. But if you would just change your mind and say, I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm a son of God. I shared this the other day. I used to live my life trying not to sin. I would wake up every day trying not to sin. I just don't want to drink today. I don't want to use today. (laughs) And inevitably, when I woke up and was thinking that way, I realized that my gaze was on my sinfulness. And one day I got the revelation that if I would take my gaze off of my sinfulness and I would put it on the one who delivered me and saved me and washed me and removed my sinfulness. And if I'd get up in the morning and say, I'm going to serve God today. I stopped saying I'm not going to drink today. I stopped, I'm going to go serve God today. What's going on today? Who's he going to, how am I, and you know what I found out? That if I did that every day, if I walked in it, walked in it, well, I'd look back in a year and I was like, man, I haven't drank. Because I fixed my gaze on who I am, on my identity. He changed my identity. You're not reconstructed, you're new construction. Are you here? You, you're, you're, he didn't just make you better. He didn't just fix you up and, and cover up the rotted places. He made you new. He says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. But if you don't believe that, you keep acting like you're old. It's a matter of shifting our perspective and saying, I want to conduct myself and regulate myself in him. Walking implies a daily, steady, step-by-step effort and progress towards a goal. It reminds me of Philippians 3. He says, I'm forgetting what's behind me and I'm reaching towards what's in front of me. Come on, too many of us are living in the past. We're thinking about what we did, what so-and-so said, how I messed up back then. You can't walk if you're always turned around looking at the back. You can't reach forward. God is saying, I need you to reach forward. Some of you today, you just need to forget what happened. Just let it go. Everybody else has let it go except for you. You're stewing in it. You're stewing in the past. You're thinking about all the failures that you made. And God is saying, I already paid for that. Get up and reach towards something in the front. How do you minister to somebody? How do you tell somebody what God did for you? Some of us, our breakthrough is in our ministry, and we won't get into ministry because we think we're disqualified. The devil wants to disqualify you. You don't have what it takes. You're not living right. How could you ever help somebody? Just go help somebody. And watch that stuff fall off of you. That stuff will fall off of you if you get get outside of yourself and begin to minister. God's real... God's true anyway. Even if I'm a liar, God's true. Come on, right? It doesn't change God. God is God. His word works. I find myself preaching messages that are for me. Like walk in him. I thought it was for Sunday. This morning he says, I was really for you, but okay, go ahead. I was just trying to tell you, you need to walk in me. You got to go tell everybody else that you, half the time I'm preaching and I go back and listen and look and God, I, I, I have to repent and change things. Come on, anybody ever change anything? I hope, I hope you're leaving here changing something. Please don't leave here hearing and not changing. It's incomplete. You're supposed to come in here, change. Come in here, change. Everybody's changing. 
Everybody's broken. This is an outpatient hospital. Everybody, this is outpatient. That person next to you with the suit, they, they sick. <laughs> I'm sick. You're sick. We're all sick. We're all here for the healer. The healer, I'm not the healer. We've come here for the healer. We've come here to hear something from God that would change us forever. Come on. It's okay. It don't get, I, I, I'm not sick. If you have a suit on, I wasn't looking at you, so just <laughs> relax. I knew a pastor that would walk out. He said he'd walk out and he'd wear a doctor's coat every Sunday. <laughs> How's that, how are all the patients doing today? <laughs> I won't do that here. See, walking isn't as impressive or as quick as running. I was telling somebody when I was a, when I was a, a kid, I went for lifeguarding class and I, you know, we got certified to be lifeguards. That's scary when you think I was 15 and they gave me the keys to keep everybody safe at the pool. Come on. I was like, is there an adult here? <laughs> I mean, think about that. I mean, not, not, if you're a lifeguard in here, I, I just, it's all good. But like I was telling the, you know, have y'all, y'all been to the pool and the kids start running? And the lifeguards are like, walk, walk. Have y'all been? Walk. And inevitably the kid's like, (laughs) it's like a fast walk. It's like, hey, it's going to be there. The slide's not going anywhere. You know why they say Walk. Because if that kid runs, he's going to slip and hurt himself. And, and worse is if he slips, runs into people, knocks everybody down and hurts everybody. That's why when you come into the church, the pastor's like, walk. <laughs> but, but, but I've got talent. And I've got ability. And I've got a calling on my life. And I've got gifts that God has given me. Walk. I need you to walk. But I want to preach. <laughs> That's what you look like. Walk. We need consistency. We don't want your talent to take you where your character cannot sustain you. Because we need you for the long haul. We need you to walk. We're not against you, we're for you. We want you to walk in your gifting, but right now, I need you to walk. Just walk. Everybody say walk. Walk. If you see somebody running, yell, walk. (laughs) Go to the park, yell at them, walk. (laughs) He wants us consistent. See, walking will get you there. I used to work on a farm. My dad had a, was a f- farmer, rancher, and we'd work on the farm, and we'd get around these 65-year-old men that were still out there doing ranch hand stuff, and they'd run circles around us, 15 years old. You know why? Because we'd get out there, and we'd start running, running to the next bale. Got this, man. By noon, we done. We're all out of steam, and that 65-year-old man that's been doing it for a long time, is saying, come on, son, we got another field. We got to finish this one. We got another one. Because they've been consistent. Consistent. It builds that, what they call that old man strength. <laughs> come on, you ever fight an old guy? It's they got that old, that OG strength, baby. It's like, you think you got him, but you don't. You better knock him out. God's trying to develop that strength. It's developed over time. It's not developed overnight. It's a long walk. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And he's saying, I don't need you to run. I need you to walk. I need you to walk in me. See, he, he, he's trying to get us to, you know how he gets me to walk in him is he puts a mentor in my life. He'll put a, he'll put a person in your life where you can work out being surrendered and submitted to somebody. But really what he's trying to do is get you submitted to him. See, so he gives you somebody that you can see so that you can submit to someone that you can't see. 
And a lot of people will say, well, I just want to submit to him. But you won't submit to someone that you can't see if you first can't submit to someone that you can see. Are you with me? Surrender. Everything is predicated on my surrender. My success is, pre- is, is determined by my level of surrender. By my level of submission, I will be blessed by that. See, it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's in the Bible. When Jesus ran into the centurion and he said, wow, I've never seen such great faith. The reason that, the, that he saw it was because he, the, the, the centurion recognized not that Jesus was in authority, but he recognized that Jesus was under authority. And he said, I recognized, he said, I recognize submission because I'm under submission. And under submission, I know I tell my men to go and they go. They don't go because of me, but they go because of who I'm submitted under, because of the hierarchy, right, because of that thing. And he goes, man, I know. So, so he said, don't even come to my house, just say the word. And I know that if you just say the word, my, my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, whoa, you got submission. Woo, I've never seen such faith. I've never seen, so, so the, our, listen, and it's a bad word in the church. I can tell it got quiet in here. Nobody's amen in me because I'm talking the S word. Because it's been abused, it's been abused, misused, it, but it doesn't change that it's true. If it's done correctly, if it's done godly, if it's done right. <laughs> God, God is saying, I want you to walk. Kids, if you're drawing pictures, I want you to draw a guy walking. Just draw, draw your best guy walking. Draw, draw your mom walking or your dad walking. Come on. Y'all can talk about that at lunch. Why he drew you that way. <laughs> I want you to walk. So when we walk, it produces a strength. It's producing a strength in me. I'm walking in him. I'm listening to him. I'm in tune with him. I know where he would go, where he doesn't go because I know him intimately. I have relationship with him. When somebody, you know, you know, when they study counterfeit, they don't study the counterfeit. They study the real thing. So they get to know the real thing. A real $100 bill, they give it to the banker and they say, I want you to know everything about the real thing. So that when something that's fake comes across your desk, you're like, that's not the real thing. Because I'm so familiar with the real thing. I am so familiar with the real thing that the false thing just I, it can't come across my desk. They don't study the false thing. They study the real thing. So we've got to study the real thing. That way when you're in it and you're, something happens and somebody goes rogue or somebody says something that's not right, you're going to be like, eh. Yeah, that ain't, that ain't in here. You show me where that's in here. Eh. I think they have a button like that in heaven. Eh. At the gate. Eh. He says, I want you to, watch the progression of this. As we walk in him, then the Bible says we become rooted. Now, we've been talking a lot about being rooted in plants and the root systems of a plant. But we know that the root systems of a plant are underneath, right? You can't see them. They're under the ground. But we do know that the underground root system of a plant holds it anchored. It produces a stability in a person. So if we're rooted, we become we become fed because the, the plant is fed through moisture and nutrients of the soil. They come through the roots and into the plant and feeds. So being rooted is important because it's what feeds you. And being rooted is important is because it, it's what anchors you. And we all know that we, we, and we've talked about this before, but I'll say it again. There's an ebb and flow to a plant growing in the natural. You have to water the plant. And then you have to not water the plant and let it dry. Let the, the environment dry. How many of y'all have ever overwatered a plant? It doesn't make it. it. It rots. It drowns. They say you drowned it. Ah, you drowned it. Because in the dry season, the roots begin to grow deeper, looking for moisture. And every Christian is trying to avoid the dry season. But the dry season is where you grow. 
The dry season is when you go deeper. It's part of the process that God has for us. He's not trying to kill us. He's trying to go deeper. He's trying to anchor us, put us in a place where we are not moved by every wind of doctrine, by every, every circumstance that hits us. We're rooted. Our, our decision is to choose to stay in the soil. Because if you're always uprooting, can I tell you that it's supernatural? I'm going to tell you in the church sometimes we make everything intellectual. And if you make it intellectual and you come in here just intellectually, I'm not saying don't be intellectual. I'm saying if you don't understand that the things of God are supernatural, as well as they will worship me in spirit and in truth, then this becomes a self-help talk. What I'm telling you today is that there's a power and a supernatural power through surrender. And that, that you, we, you can do things on your own, but God can do things that you can't do. So if you get in the soil of a church and you plant yourself here, and let me just tell you, if you're here, there's a chance you're going to be offended. Because I've been offended. <laughs> and if you haven't been offended, hang on, it's coming. Because we're all people. If you look around, it's diverse. Different backgrounds, different upbringings, different everything. And we're all coming together. It's inevitable. Somebody's going to say something that's going to rub you wrong. And you're going to need the supernatural power of God because your flesh is going to say, let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. That's what your flesh is going to say. But when you have the supernatural power of God through submission, you're going to know I can't get out of here. i got to stick in this thing because God's doing something in me. And... Because what you don't understand is when you get down and go down to that oil, other soil at the other place, the same thing's going to happen. Because there's a whole bunch of other people that different backgrounds. And you'll find yourself uprooting yourself and uprooting yourself, going from church to church, and everybody's wrong. <laughs> Eventually, you got to sit and say, well, well, the common denominator is... is is me. You're going to have problems everywhere you go. God sets you in the church. Don't, don't forget that. Don't ever join a church out of emotion, out of manipulation. You pray. You pray and say, God, is this the one? And he'll answer you and he'll tell you. And when he tells you that's the one, you get in there, go all in, stay planted, and hang on. You're going to have dry seasons and you're going to have watering seasons. But at the end, you're going to grow. And at the end, you're going to grow strong enough that you're going to be able to hold fruit. You walk. You walk. Everybody say walk. So be rooted. So draw a plant on, your, on, your, on this thing here. Kids, draw, uh, draw me a big tree. Whatever you want. An orange tree, whatever you want to do. The second thing he says is... He, be built up. That's external. So the roots are internal. They're, they're down deep. You can't see them. But then he says there should be something external. We should be building something on the outside. The picture of this word in the Greek is a building under construction. The, the Bible says that Jesus is my, he's my cornerstone. Jesus is the stone that I lay down first that everything in my life has to align to, level to, and plumb to. So when you start building, don't ever forget. Listen, sometimes we get so busy building that we don't revisit the cornerstone. And we start building and building and putting things on top of things. And we say it's God, but we haven't, we haven't even checked with God. We haven't looked back at the cornerstone and we'll find ourselves in a zigzaggedy pa pattern and we're way off. Before you lay any brick, you looked at that cornerstone and say, is it in line? Is it in line with what God has? When you start building on top, is it plumb or is it leaning? When you join a church, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor and the teacher have a responsibility to operate together in the church to build the church. You all are, we are all living stones in the church. 
and Jesus is the cornerstone. So whatever we build here, we build it against the cornerstone. And every, every so often we'll start building a system of leadership and it'll start leading to the left. But we can't knock it down and destroy it because those are the living stones that belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We must carefully pull down the, stone, the wall with care, saving every living stone that we can, treating them with dignity and respect, not blaming them that the wall's crooked. Listen, if the wall's crooked, that apostle's off. He should have been checking the blueprint. It's not the wall's fault that it's crooked. It's whoever was overseeing the building of the wall that it's crooked. Are you with me? So listen, if, if, you have, if you feel like you have the gift of prophecy, you're a prophet. A prophet will never destroy. He will always encourage, edify, and comfort. And he will remove that wall in such a manner as to rebuild the wall better. Mm -hmm. That's really good. It's not mine, but it's really good. <laughs> he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to root you, I'm going to build you up, and I'm going to establish you. Established in the Greek, it's a picture of a guarantee. It's a legal term, like a, like a covenant. It's a confirmation. It's a guarantee. It's a test result. It's something that's signed. It's established. It's, it's finished. So if you're drawing on your pictures, draw a contract on there. Draw a piece of paper or a document on there. It's reliable, it's tested, you can put weight on it. See, God is saying, I want you to, listen, I'm going to recap this thing. God is saying, I want you to walk in me. And in, my, in you walking in me, I'm going to root you, I'm going to build you, and I'm going to establish you. And I'm going to cause an overflow in you. And everybody gets happy. Over, who wants overflow? Can, can, can we read the scripture? Can we read the scripture so that we get it right and we don't get it wrong? He says, I'm going to overflow you with a thanksgiving and a gratefulness. Oh, man. I thought it was an overflow of pink Cadillacs. Dang. No. He's going to give you something worth way more than that stuff. You know, all that stuff's going to burn up. All that stuff's going to burn up. It's temporary. I went to the wings, and uh, everybody, you all might know Brandy Valentine, Minister Brandy. I, I've known them for a long time, as long as I've known you all, Carrie. You know, I met, them, I met them through you. Every time I talk to Brandy Valentine, I'm inspired. I have never heard Brandy Valentine ever say a negative word, ever. We were talking while we were there. She's so full of faith. She's ministering. She goes into strip clubs. And they minister to the girls in the clubs. They've pulled girls out of the club. They've pulled bouncers out of the club. They're doing an amazing work. She ministers to people who are down and out. Little girls, that, little, young, young ladies that they'll find sleeping on an open slab in the middle of downtown Mobile, Alabama, bitten up by ants, feeling worthless. She takes them in, works with them. I, you know that, that girl, you know, did you know Summer waited on me uh, at the restaurant? She's already out of the wings. She's not at the wings anymore. She got married, and she's a waitress. At a, and when we were eating, she came up to me. She's like, oh, she came up to him and recognized him from the wings. Like real fruit. She's not in recovery. She's recovered. Come on, she's like walking it out. She's walking it out. But as I was preparing for this message, I want to be like Brandy. I want to be thankful. Because I know Brandy's story, and it's hard for her to get negative because she's so thankful. Because of what God brought her out of. And she never forgets what God brought her out of. And man, we, you can be in a meeting with Brandy and somebody say something negative and, and, and she'll just come back around. Yeah, but, 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 yeah, but God is good, man. He's in it. He's going to make it. We're going to make it. It's not, it's not over. Come on. Get your faith out there. 
We need brandies. God wants to make us like that. We're so rooted. We're so built up in, we're so rooted in faith, built up in faith, and established in faith. We're so rooted, established, and strong that we just overflow with thanksgiving and grace. I'm going to tell you something. When you hit the world with that kind of overflow, they're going to want to come. Because they're going to be like, what do you have? Sometimes the issue is we go to church, tell everybody we go to church, and they say, I don't want what you got. Mm. <laughs> but it's time, church. It's time to walk in him. How do you do that? You surrender. Stand to your feet today. Stand to your feet today. We're, gonna, we're about to stop. Nobody moving around. Don't, don't leave if you don't have to leave. Give the Holy Spirit an opportunity. I never like to leave without giving the Holy Spirit an opportunity. So everything that I said is awesome. I'm going to walk in him. Yeah, I'm going to walk in him, and I'm going to get rooted and built and established and overflow, and it's all predicated on your surrender. <laughs> Will you surrender to him? Now, you may be out there, and you're surrendered to him. And you may be out there, and you're halfway surrendered to him. I'm going to tell you, halfway, three-quarters of the way, don't work in getting the kingdom. It's all in or no go. You either is or you ain't. <laughs> so right now, just all over the room, eyes open. Because this surrender, this covenant with God, this relationship with God is not meant to be in the dark. It's not meant to be just you. It's meant to be done in, in the presence of witnesses. You're marrying him. You're saying, I want to be married to him. I want to be surrendered to him. I'm going to be his wife. I'm going to walk with him all the days of my life. That's what he's looking for this morning. If I've been talking today and you're far from God and you're not surrendered to him, you've drawn lines, whatever it is, you're frustrated, you're offended, you're, full, you're, 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 you're living and you're miserable because you know you're not right with him. If that's you right now, I want you to get out of your chair and just get down here right now. In Jesus' name, I command you in the name. I don't invite you for that. I command you, if he's talking to you, if he's speaking to you, today might be the day. Who's, who needs to come? You need to get out of your chair and come. You forget about who's with you. Forget about it. You need to come. Come on, you want to surrender your life to God? You want to give it all to him? You need to come. You need to say, I, I want to do that. I want to give my life to him. Who else? There's more people in here that need to come. And I'm just going to tell you right now, you can You can go. God loves you. He's not trying to hurt you. You're not, you're not, you haven't gone too far that he can't reach you. I know there's people in here, I can feel this in my spirit. There's people in here that are saying, man, I've done that so many times, I don't even want to do it again. What if today's the day? He told Naaman to dip seven times. What if you're quitting on six? And what if today's the day? What if this is the dip? You have absolutely nothing to lose and everything to gain. Nothing to lose and everything to gain with, with God. All right. Let me make sure I have some leadership. My life group leaders, just stand behind these families right now. I want somebody behind everybody right now. Amen. Look, come some more folks. Amen. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. If you need to come, come on up. There's people still coming. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. people coming. There's more people coming. Just come on. Hallelujah. 
Aleluya. Can I just tell everybody, let me, let me just really quick, just, he died on the cross 2,000 years ago. He came to reverse everything that Adam had given away. He came to put it back. And when he died on that cross, for you, for, I don't know where you've been, I don't know what you've done. But when he died, he died, he died for you, specifically for you. And he knew that there would be a time where we would reject him. He died, when he died for me, I rejected him all my 20s, all my, my teen years. I mocked him, rejected. I didn't want to have nothing to do with church. But I had a grandmother that prayed. And she never gave up praying for me. She just prayed for me and prayed for me. She wasn't seeing nothing. I gave her nothing to grab onto. But one day I realized my sinfulness, and I hope that today that's what you're realizing, that we all fall short of the glory of God. We're not, it's not a shaming moment up here where we say, man, I'm sinful. It's, it's your, hey, welcome. We are all sinful. Because everyone in here that's a believer walked the aisle like you've walked the aisle, and we've all just come to terms to say, man, I, I've broken the rules, and I, I, I don't deserve I, I don't deserve to, to I, I've done things in my life that are not right. But Jesus said, man, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He says, but if, if you will come and you will confess me before men, if you believe in your heart that I died for you and that my blood covers your sin and you're forgiven, and that you believe that I raised from the dead and I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit on the inside so that you can walk in me, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. And then you belong to me. In the story of the prodigal, when, the, when they came up, when the son came home, that's what you're doing. The sons and the daughters come home. You're not coming home to me. This is not about me. I'm just up here. You're coming home to him. In your heart, you're saying, I'm coming home, Lord. And in that moment, he will not reject you. He'll take his jacket and he puts it on you. And she, when he puts his jacket on you, He's saying, you're mine. You're a daughter. You're not a drug addict. You're not this. You're not what they said. You're mine. And he gives you that jacket. Then he puts sandals on your feet, which means that you're, you belong to him. You're, you're a daughter and a son. Amen. You're a daughter and a son. And the next thing that's left is the ring. He's going to give you authority because there's a job for you. Because there's people that you know that I don't know, and the person next to you doesn't know, but you know them. And whatever's happening in your heart today, I would challenge you today. When you leave today, I know you can say, well, I don't, I don't know anything. You know, what you, you know what you know. You know that he did something in you today. I'd call everybody I know in my circle. and I remember I did that. I called everybody I knew, and you're not going to believe what happened to me. I got saved today. I gave my life to Christ today. I'm washed and forgiven. And that's the testimony of the people that you know. I don't know them. You know them. Amen. Let's pray together. Like, bow your heads with me. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. Church, stretch your hands out to these folks. Say, Heavenly Father, forgive me for all my sin. I repent. I turn my heart to you. I believe and confess that your blood has set me free. And on the third day, you raised from the dead. And you've given me the Holy Spirit to live for you. Thank you for giving me eternal life in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen.